Om Shrinman to Bishwe Amritasya Putra Ayedamani Divyani Tastu Vedahametam Purusham Mahantam Aditya Varnam Tamasa Parastat Tuameva Viditwa Atim Rituareti Nanya Panta Vidyate Yanaya Utishtata Jagrita Prabhyavarani Buddha Utishtata Jagrita Prabhyavarani Buddha Hear ye, children of immortal bliss, even ye that reside in higher spheres. I have found the Ancient One who is beyond all darkness and all delusion. Knowing him alone, you shall be saved from death. There is no other way. Arise, awake and stop not till the goal is reached. Arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. Good morning. Good morning. The topic this morning is who am I? If we ask ourselves this question, we come up with various answers according to our own viewpoint of ourselves. How do we view ourselves? We may say, I'm a man or I'm a woman. I'm American or I'm Indian, tall or short, blonde, brunette, young, old. These are all descriptions of our body. Or we may say, I'm a nun, I'm a nurse, a teacher, a cook. Or as the old saying goes, doctor, lawyer, merchant, chief, rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. These are all what we do here. I feel identified with my body and the mind, and so I call myself an individual being. When I'm called by a certain name, I respond to it. I think it's mine. When I, a certain description is given, I recognize myself. This is my mistake. My senses perceive appearances which are outside me. The senses and my mind are creating all this trouble. How did we come to this identification with various personas, with this body and mind complex, and even with the outside things, the work that we do? According to Vedantic philosophy, the true self of man is of the nature of divinity. He's perfect. He's pure. He's eternal. He's infinite. Yet we find ourselves, through the influence of maya, illusion or ignorance, identified with so many other things. Maya is said to have two powers, the veiling power of ignorance and the projecting power of illusion, vikshepa shakti. Maya works on both the cosmic level and also it works within the individual himself. When the universe evolves, it begins in a very subtle causal state. Here it is luminous, very fine, almost a perfect manifestation of divinity. It is the first cause, or evolute. 
And from here, it becomes more and more degenerated until it becomes this gross manifestation. This happens through the power of maya. Swami Vivekananda has a beautiful series of lectures in Jnana Yoga called Maya, Maya and the Evolution of the Concept of God, and Maya and Freedom. And I recommend that you all read these three lectures. Swamiji himself once said he considered these to be his best lectures. Here he gives us a list of many things, from the gross to the subtle. And each time he says, and this is Maya. All this is Maya runs like a refrain through these lectures. Maya also affects our subjective universe. We have first a causal, very subtle, almost perfect state of mind, or bhuti, very pure. Sri Ramakrishna actually said one time, pure bhuti is Brahman. Pure intelligence is God, deep hidden in the lotus of the heart, as the Upanishads tell us. The first causal manifestation of mind, and it is followed by other states of mind, the vital force and the senses. These things are not altogether just subjective in a person. They also are instrumental and therefore partly objective. But they're so mixed up with our identification with ourselves that we call them subjective. But if we meditate on them deeply, we find that they too are a degeneration of our true nature, our true state. We are identified more or less with our bodies and our minds. And we live as though this is the reality. In fact, in Western thought, that which can be measured, experienced by the senses, the most gross of all manifestations, is what we mean when we say real or reality. We continually ask ourselves, why am I here? Who am I? We do this because we have forgotten, through the power of Maya, our real divine nature. Swamiji tells us the whole human knowledge is a generalization of this Maya, an attempt to know it as it appears to be. This is the work of Nama Rupa, name and form. Everything has a form. Everything that calls up an idea in your mind with a name is within Maya. For everything that is bound by the laws of time, space, and causation is within Maya. It is bound by death. We're told the story of Narada, who asked Krishna to show him what is Maya. After a few days, Krishna asked Narada to take a trip with him. And after walking some time, Krishna said he was thirsty, and he asked Narada to bring some water for him to drink. Narada went to look for the water. He came to a village, and he knocked on a door and it was opened by a beautiful young girl. Narada forgot his master was waiting for water. He forgot everything, and he began to talk to the girl. Over time, this ripened into love. He married her. They had children. And then there came a huge flood, and the river flooded the entire village. People were being swept away in the flood. Narada's wife and children were all swept away. And in the end, he was thrown on the bank of the river, weeping. Then came a voice behind him. My child, where is the water? You've been gone a half an hour. Half an hour, said Narada. Twelve years had passed through his mind. All this had happened in half an hour. It was Maya. Time, the all-destroyer, comes, and nothing is left. He swallows up everything. We're all rushing toward death, and so we're trying to forget. We're trying to forget. Trying to create oblivion by all sorts of sense pleasures. During the plague, the saying, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die, came into being. Everyone was trying to forget that death was upon them. And this is Maya. 
There is no reason why the soul should not know itself as it is, pure and perfect, yet the soul does not have this knowledge. We have somehow become involved with matter and mind, and we think we are these things. Swamiji tells us that religion begins with the tremendous dissatisfaction with the present state of things, with our lives, and a disgust with this patching up of our lives. When a man takes this stand, he is on the way to find the truth. He is on the way to God. The Vedas tell us, be not in despair. The way is very difficult, like walking on the edge of a razor. Yet fear not. Arise, awake, and find the ideal. Stop not till the goal is reached. The question arises, what is this universe? From what does it arise, and into what does it go? And Swamiji gives us the answer. In freedom, it rises. In freedom, it rests, and into freedom, it melts away. This idea of freedom, you cannot relinquish. Your actions, your very lives, will be lost without it. Every moment, nature is proving us to be slaves and not free. At every step, we're knocked down, as it were, by Maya, and shown that we are bound. And yet, at the same moment, with this blow comes another feeling that we are free. Some inner voice tells us we are free. But if we attempt to realize that freedom, to make it manifest, we find the difficulties almost insurmountable. Yet in spite of that, the inner voice insists on asserting itself inwardly. I am free. I am free. As soon as you know the voice and understand what it is, the whole scene changes. As soon as we understand the voice and see the reason why this struggle should be here, this fight, this competition, these difficulties, this cruelty, these little pleasures and joys, we see that they are in the nature of things because without them, there would be no going toward that voice, which we are destined to attain, whether we know it or not. All human life, all nature, therefore, is struggling to attain freedom. Swamiji says, the sun is moving toward that goal. So is the earth circling around the sun. So is the moon circling around the earth. To that goal, the planets are moving, the air is blowing. Everything is struggling toward that freedom. The saint is going toward that voice. He cannot help it. It's no glory toward him. So is the sinner. The charitable man is going straight toward that voice and cannot be hindered. A miser also is going to the same destination. So is the most errant idler. One stumbles more than another. He who stumbles we call bad. He who stumbles less we call good. He whom the sages have been seeking in all these places is in our own heart. The voice that you heard was right, says Vedanta, but the direction that you gave the voice was wrong. The ideal of freedom that you perceived was correct. But you projected it outside yourself, and that was your mistake. Bring it near till you find that all the time it was within you. It was the self of your own self. The freedom was your own nature, and this Maya never bound you. Maya, instead of being horrible, a hopeless dream as it is now, will become beautiful. This earth, instead of being a prison house, will become a playground. And even dangers and difficulties, even all suffering, will become deified. The one who is in us, our own real nature, will show us that behind everything, as the substance of everything, he is standing, and he is our own real self. Let us think about our own soul first. In Sanskrit, it's called jivatma, which is translated as individual soul. What is the individual soul? The soul in its own true nature, which is spirit, is pure and perfect. But for some reason, it has become associated with the mind and body. 
This association of the soul with mind and body presupposes a certain weakness or a lack in the soul. But how can the soul, which is pure and perfect, have any weakness? This is called avidya or maya, ignorance. Not just a lack of knowledge, but rather having mistaken ideas about reality. The idea of seeing a snake superimposed on a rope is given. The mistake is in the mind. We have hypnotized ourselves. But wait, the mind is in consciousness. Consciousness, or chaitanya, is its own proof. It is the proof of everything else. Consciousness is truly self-existent. It is beyond any condition. It is imperishable and eternal. And when it is realized as such, a person finds that it has its own proof. Just as the sun does not need the help of any other light to show itself, just as the sun does not need the help of a candle to show itself, its own light reveals it and reveals other things as well. By his light, all this is lighted. Whenever we want to think about something, our starting point always has to be the mind. It is the conscious mind with which we must start. The intellect has gone far ahead of our life in most parts of the world. We think about very profound things, but we aren't able to live up to these ideas. Our lives have become undisciplined. We know about many things. We want to be rational, but we're not able to live up to our intellectual convictions. We read and talk about the highest philosophy, but we don't want to discipline ourselves. The gap between our life and our convictions can be filled. If we study and believe in the higher Vedantic truths, if we want these truths to become a reality in our lives, we have to practice spiritual disciplines. This is where religion comes in and tries to point out the path to realization. We have to understand there is a principle of correlation between the individual and the universal. They run parallel to each other, as it were. We can see that within the world of matter, there are or seem to be an infinite number of little islands of matter that seem to be individual. And yet, they are not completely separate. Little individual consciousnesses, as it were. My own individuality is dependent upon the prevalence of certain conditions outside of me. Heat, cold, air, light, and so on. Any change in this objective universe would bring about a corresponding change in me. My life seems to be functioning for my own individual purposes, yet it is not completely independent of the objective universe. It depends on it also. The individual is, as it were, the subject and the universe is the object. We tend to try to explain everything in terms of the objective universe as a process within the external world. However, this is really one-sided. It can also be looked upon as a subjective reality. A purely objective approach is bound to fall short of the truth. It is both subjective and objective. So in order to explain our own body, we have to explain the origin of matter itself. All our science studies this material universe, but everything that we know is in our mind, our own consciousness. It is always X plus the mind, as it were. My life seems to stand separate from other lives, and yet we see that it depends on these other lives, too. There is a universal, all-pervading consciousness, which is so vast that it is beyond any words. It cannot be described. We start with this basic, indescribable existence, Brahman, Sat. When this individual spirit is considered cosmically, it is called Ishwara, the all-knowing spirit. When we think of God as the creator, then immediately we have to consider the creation, the world, 
Jagat. Ishwara is one being, undivided and unrelated to creation. And yet, the same Ishwara is also made up of an infinite number of effulgent souls or individual souls. These individual souls are given the name Pragna. At that level of creation, there is only consciousness. Only consciousness in the individual soul, illuminating consciousness. This separation into individual souls is only an apparent reality. The universal cosmic mind has appeared to split itself into akasha and prana, but beyond this is the universal soul, which appears to become evolved as mind and body. Yet Swamiji tells us that the soul of man, because it is separate from mind and body, because it is not composed of akasha and prana, is really immortal. It has existed throughout eternity. It never dies. When the body dies, the vital forces of the man go back to his mind, and the mind becomes dissolved in prana, and that prana enters into the soul of man, and the soul of man comes out clothed in the subtle body, the mental body or spiritual body. In this body lie the samskaras of a man, his character, everything that we have thought, every action that we've done, is lodged in the mind in a fine form, in the chitta. And when we die, the sum total of these impressions use the fine body as a medium, and the jiva takes a new body according to these fine impressions in the mind. In his lecture on the real and apparent man, Swamiji tells us that there is but one Atman, eternally pure, eternally perfect, unchangeable, and all these various changes in the universe are but appearances of the one self. Upon it, name and form have painted these dreams. It is this maya that creates individuals and makes one appear different from another. We see these bodies and minds as different in quality and in form, clothed in time, space, and causation, the manifold universe appears in the ocean of the infinite. Even as clouds of various colors come before the sky and remain there for a moment and then vanish away, even so, before this soul, come all these visions of earth and heaven, of moon and stars, of pleasures and pains, but they all pass away leaving behind the unchangeable spirit. Swamiji says, it's like a mirage. It is an illusion. We think we're bound, but we are, in essence, free. There is but one all-comprehending existence, and that existence appears as manifold. This self or soul or substance is all that exists in the universe. The self is Brahman, and it appears to be manifold by the superimposition of name and form. In the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, he gives the example of the sun shining down on pots of water, reflecting itself in each one. And he asks, when all the pots are broken, what remains? Girish, intelligent man that he was, said, the sun remains. Swamiji said, I mean, Sri Ramakrishna says, no. Only that which is remain. What is, is. Only that which is remains. This is really a subject for meditation. Swamiji says, you are a mind, I am a mind. Everyone is a mind. And yet, the very same universe viewed from the standpoint of knowledge, when the eyes have been cleared of delusions, when the mind has become pure, appears as unbroken, absolute being, ever pure, unchangeable, and immortal. Why then do we think we're born and we die? The whole of nature is a book before the soul. 
It is nature that is changing, not the soul of man. This never changes. Birth and death are in nature, not in you. Just as we think under delusion that the sun is moving and not the earth, in exactly the same way we think we're dying and not nature. When men are in a certain frame of mind, they see this very existence as earth, the sun, the moon, the stars. All those who are in the same mind see the same things. It is this universe which from the human plane is seen as earth, sun, moon, and stars, and all such things. In the body and mind is the momentum of our past acts. So it will live for some time until that momentum of past work is exhausted, until that momentum is worked out. Then the body and mind will fall, and the soul will be free. The man who has in this life attained to the state for whom the ordinary vision of the world has changed and the reality has been shown to be apparent only, he is called free while living. Religion can be realized. Are you ready? Do you want it? You will get the realization if you do, and then you will be truly religious. Until you have attained to realization, know that you're not really sincere. Realization does the greatest good to the world. Then does a man love when he finds out that the object of his love is not material only, but God himself. That mother will love her children more when she knows they are God himself. That man will love a holy man who knows that the holy man is God himself. And that very man will also love the unholiest of men because he knows that the background of that unholiest of men is even he, the Lord. For him the little self is dead, and God stands in its place. For him the whole universe becomes transfigured. If one millionth part of the men and women who live in this world simply sit down for a few minutes and say, You are all God. O oh, ye men, O oh, ye animals, all living beings, you are all the manifestations of the living reality the one living deity, the whole world will be changed in half an hour. This is the greatest gain to humanity. The air that we breathe will say with every one of its vibrations, Thou art that. And the whole universe, through everything that speaks with one voice, will say, Thou art that. Twat tat twamasi. These are Swamiji's words. We have very strong instincts and desires. Take, for example, the sexual desire. Even this, in its lowest and grossest form, is a desire for unity. And the soul is the seat of all unity. If a person can meditate on the idea that within himself is infinitely more of all he has been seeking in human love, more beauty, more love, more unity, then he can actually become free from the idea of sex. This is the truth, but sometimes it takes many births before we realize that we can never be satisfied within the gross realm. Real satisfaction is only in the spirit, like Yayati found out. To try to fulfill our desires here is like pouring ghee on a fire. It only increases. Eventually there comes a kind of awakening where it is seen that all the little loves that we have are only a reflection of that higher love, love that is in the spirit. And then we turn toward that light. So here we are, the eternal spirit the conscious being here in this body, which is a living object. The mind is both conscious and yet identified with the body. Our ego sense, our intelligence, our mind, even our senses all seem to be part of ourselves. 
we appear to be part of this gross universe. If I believe that I'm only a body, then I believe this is all that there is. Yet there is in me a higher being, my effulgent self, called Taijasa. And beyond that is my omniscient, eternally wise self, called Pragna. And also is yet my higher self, the absolute immutable one, the Atman, or Brahman. If my sense of I-ness shifts and becomes identified with my effulgent self, or with my omniscient self, or with the absolute self, at once my whole universe will change. It is possible for the soul to wake up, as it were. If we feel we're part of this subtle universe, we feel closer to God and feel the effulgent self within. Then we will always feel a sense of light. We will begin to feel at one with all beings. If we go still further, we begin to come lost in utter identity. Everything is related. The material universe and the subtle universe, but they are all appearances only. Is it possible that even my ignorance, even now, I am also the infinite, absolute spirit? Why don't I know it? Why do the body, mind, and spirit seem to be combined? How does this happen? It's like a dream, an illusion, where things are superimposed on each other. The real appears, and the unreal takes the form of the real. The soul associated with the mind and with intelligence, and then with the senses and vitality, it comes into a womb and is associated with a body. And when the body becomes mature enough, it appears on this earth. It is born. Not only that, but we have desires. We come to fulfill these desires. This is why we're born in a body. And this is why we give the world importance. It is the place we come to fulfill our desires. We come to this physical universe and we suffer. We appear to be bound by the laws of this universe. But even while we weep and think ourselves to be small, to be part of this gross universe, we are still the subtle soul. And beyond that, we are one with the absolute spirit. If our will becomes concentrated, and if we get the grace of God, the grace of our own mind, we will realize the divinity within us, even at this very moment, and become free. If we could remember who we were, we would see that we don't need anything outside. Desire for experience arises from this sense of lack, and this comes because we've forgotten our own true nature. Our real nature is complete and perfect, with no need for anything outside. Sometimes it is said that the soul, when it has experienced enough, awakens from illusions and the necessity for experience is over, and therefore this dream of life and death comes to an end. Sometimes it is the shock of an extremely painful experience which awakens the soul. The suffering of a great injustice or a bereavement can suddenly wake the soul out of its dream, its ignorance, and the whole process of this samsara or transmigration suddenly stops. As the Grateful Dead once said, wake me, shake me, don't let me sleep too long. <laughs> As human beings, we are thinking beings. We have a buddhi, a capacity to deliberate and choose. Along with this, we have manas and citta, the sense of I-ness. And then comes ahamkara, the phase of the mind called ego. This ego tends to function most in the manas, where I has to make choices. When the mind has a desire or chooses what it wants, there the ego functions. Egotism strives on the recognition of other people with whom we can compare ourselves and find ourselves to be superior. The I never stands alone. It always is associated with the buddhi or manas. If the I is the subject, it is always accompanied by a predicate, 
except during deep sleep. In deep sleep, it remains in the witness state. What is this I? The I is not one thing at all. To say that it is a function of the mind is to tell a half-truth. It is made up of two things, chit, consciousness, and jada, the unconscious principle. Chit is the light of the true self, which is perfect. It is the light of all that shines. What is presented by the intelligence is the unconscious, the sentient, insentient aspect of our ego, and the two together give us this sense of egoism. The pure ego, which is a reflection of the pure self, becomes associated with the predicate, and the two together become the ego. The phenomenal existence is jada, it's unconscious, insentient. The light of the pure self, the chit falls upon it, and the ego is produced. The ego has been called chit jada granti, the knot that makes the two strands one, pure consciousness and the material phenomena. The two are bound together, or they appear to be, and then we have this sense of I. If we could just say I am, or just I, with no verb attached, then that I would no longer be the ego. It would be the pure self, the pure self-conscious being. This is the knot of the heart, which we are seeking to cut asunder. And this is what happened to Ramana Maharshi when he meditated on who am I and realized his own nature. Let me give you his description in his own words. It was in 1896, about six weeks before I left Madurai for good, that this great change in my life took place. I was sitting alone in a room on the first floor of my uncle's house. I seldom had any sickness, and on that day there was nothing wrong with my health. But suddenly, a violent fear of death overtook me. There was nothing in my state of health to account for it nor was there any urge in me to find out whether there was any account for the fear. I just felt I was going to die, and I began to think, what should I do about it? It did not occur to me to consult a doctor or any of my elders or friends. I felt I had to solve the problem myself, then and there. He was about 12 years old at this time, by the way. The shock of the fear of death drove my mind inward, and I said to myself mentally, without actually framing the words. Now death has come. What does it mean? What is it that is dying? This body dies. And at once I dramatized the occurrence of death. I lay with my limbs stretched out and still, as though rigor mortis had set in, and imitated a corpse. So to give myself a greater reality into the inquiry, I held my breath and kept my lips tightly closed so that no sound could escape, and that neither the word I nor any other word could be uttered. Well then, I said to myself, this body is dead. It will be carried stiff to the burning ground, and there burnt and reduced to ashes. But with the death of the body, am I dead? Is the body I? Is it silent and inert? but I feel the full force of my personality and in the voice of I within me, apart from it. So I am the spirit transcending the body. The body dies, but the spirit transcending it cannot be touched by death. That means I am the deathless spirit. All this was not a dull thought. It flashed through me as vividly as living truths which I perceived directly almost without a thought process. It was something real, the only real thing about my present state. And all the conscious activity connected with the body was centered on that I. From that moment onwards, the I or self-focused attention on itself by a powerful fascination. Fear of death vanished once and for all. The ego was lost in the flood of self-awareness. Absorption in the self has continued unbroken from that time. He tells us, 
That which arises as I in the body is the mind. If one inquires as to where the body got the thought, the I rises first, one would discover that it rises in the heart. That is the place of the mind's origin. Even if one thinks constantly, I, I, one will be led to that place. Of all the thoughts that arise in the mind, the I thought is the first. It is only after the rise of the I thought that other thoughts occur. The thought, who am I, will destroy all other thoughts. And like the stick used for stirring the funeral pyre, it's itself will be burnt up in the end. Then there will be self-realization. When other thoughts arise, one should not pursue them, but should diligently inquire, to whom do they occur? It does not matter how many thoughts arise. As each thought arises, one should inquire with alertness, to whom has this thought occurred? The answer that would merge would be to me. And thereupon, if one inquires, who am I? The mind will go back to its source, and the thought that arose will subside. Always behind these functions of the mind, we hear that inner voice, a voice calling us. Freedom comes when we deliberately, through spiritual practices, free ourselves from the bondage of the sense world. At first, our knowledge depends on the body and the senses, and even our best efforts are based on sense perception. When our perception becomes more internal, then the mind becomes free from its bondage to the body. Instead of looking for the truth outside, we turn inward. The heart of the universe is within us, within our own hearts, deep hidden in the lotus of the heart, as the scriptures tell us. We have to free the mind. First, we remove our gross desires for external things, and then the scattered mind, the objectified mind, the deliberative mind, becomes focused, more subtle and intuitive. The intuitive mind brings the knowledge that we're not this body or mind. It is not an intellectual knowledge. It is an actual perception. You feel separate from the body. First, you feel that you are in the body, but free from it, like the ripe coconut that moves in the shell, as Ramakrishna tells us. But through a vyasa and vairagyam practice and renunciation, the mind ultimately becomes still. The mind feels that changeless, unmoving, absolute being, which is the support of the whole universe, and which is the background upon which this ever-changing universe appears and disappears with all its manifestations. Sit still and merge with that unitary reality, the unchanging, peaceful being. Practice. Learn to feel this one being more and more. The body will die in the course of time, but it has nothing to do with this eternal reality, the eternal life. This unitary reality is the source of the real vitality or life of the soul. It doesn't matter if the body's getting old and has aches and pains and is slowly falling apart. Tell yourself, I'm not the body. I am not the mind. The real life of the soul is within, and it is a source of unending joy. This vitality is within every one of us, and it does not die. But in order to realize, we also have to be established in vairagya, or dispassion. This word means literally uncoloring. All the beautiful forms and colors of the world, of name and form, no longer attract you. It all pales into insignificance. I've had people ask me, do I have to renounce? And you know, as long as the question is there, the time is not right for you. Ramakrishna once told the story of a very young child who said to his mother, Mother, please wake me when the call of nature comes. The mother smiled and said, At that time you will wake up by yourself. 
The question doesn't arise. The world is no longer attractive to you. There's nothing there for you. You have no choice. Things fall away from you by themselves. You are no longer attracted to them. The illusion is over. The dream is broken and you are free, aware of the one reality, that divine being which is the essence of yourself. He is the nearest of the near. If you catch even a glimpse of him, you will know this is the answer to all your seeking. You have fallen in love with him, the one who is love himself, and the soul then really seeks for him. This will be the only attractive thing to you. You will want nothing else. Then the soul yearns for God. It weeps for him. It cries a real cry, and it does not stop till it is united with him. The soul simply rushes into that light and joy. You have no choice at all. The Bhagavad Gita tells us, bitter toil at first, but at last what sweetness, what sweetness, the end of sorrow. Then we shall know we are free, Swamiji tells us. Then Maya, instead of being a hopeless dream, will become beautiful. This earth, instead of being a prison, will be a playground. And all suffering will become deified and show us their real nature. Show us that behind everything, as the substance of everything, he is standing and he is our own true self. He who sees in this world of manifoldness, that one running through all, in this world of death, he who finds that one infinite life, and in this world of insentience and ignorance, he who finds that one light and knowledge, unto him belongs eternal peace. Unto none else, unto none else. In his lecture on the real and apparent man, Swamiji tells us, there are men for whom delusion has vanished forever. Two wheels joined together by one pole are turning together. If with an axe I cut the pole asunder and get hold of one of the wheels, it stops. But in the other wheel is past momentum, so it runs on a little and falls down. This pure and perfect being, the soul, is one wheel, and this external hallucination of body and mind is the other wheel, and they are joined together by the pull of work or karma. Knowledge is the axe which will sever the bond between the two, and the wheel of the soul will stop. Stop thinking that it's coming and going, living and dying. Stop thinking that it's part of nature and has wants and desires, and will find that it is perfect, desireless. But in the other wheel, that of the body and mind, will be the momentum of past acts. So it will live on for some time, until that momentum of past works is exhausted, until that momentum is worked out. Then the body and mind will fall, and the soul will be free. Nor, no more is there any going to heaven or coming back, not even going to Brahma Loka or any of the higher spheres. For where is the soul to come? Where is it to go? The man who has in this life attained to this state, for whom, for a minute at least, the ordinary vision of the world has changed, the reality has become apparent. He is called free while living, jiva mukti. This is the goal of the Vedantist, to attain freedom in life. The whole world is based on unity. When you've made yourself one with that unity, you have reached the very heart of the universe. If I want to live up to this truth, then not only my perceptions, not only my behaviors, not only my expectations should be based on that fact that everyone is the divine reality, but I must know that I myself am that reality too. I have to live in the consciousness of it. I must not be conscious of anything else. I say all this is verily Brahman, the world appears real because behind this fantasy of form there is the existence of God. Life has meaning because there is the presence of divinity. Know everything to be God, and everything will be fulfilled, for out of that knowledge comes infinite love, infinite peace, 
infinite joy, infinite kindness and compassion, and infinite service. I also am that being, consciousness, bliss, absolute. Sri Ramakrishna said when a person first has the vision of light, he is astonished and he says, what is this? What is this? It is so unusual, so different from anything you see here. No light we see here compares with that light in the heart. You see more and more till you recognize what that light is. You recognize that it is divine light. You feel that you yourself have risen above the body and mind. You feel you are no longer bound by them. And it is in that state that you begin to see the face of truth. Go forward and merge with the real self that dwells in your own heart. Seek the truth. Be one with it. Let vision cease. And if you cannot, dream but truer dreams, eternal love, and service free. Thank you.